And so I'm happy to be here today to speak with you about a, a very topical issue, an issue that's been, uh, uh, I think, attracting a lot of attention and, um, and, and a topic I find quite fascinating. And I've spent many years uh, engaged in, uh, in uh, formal research in this area, I've written a great deal, and I'm happy to uh, share with you some, some issues pertinent to the topic at hand, which is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So we'll get going. So here are just my um, funding sources for my uh, psilocybin research. I've been supported by the Hefter Research Institute and the Betsy Gordon Foundation for studies I've done with MDMA. I've been supported primarily by MAPS. Uh, the Cohen Foundation will be supporting a, a new study in preparation that'll use a psilocybin treatment model in the palliative care setting. And finally, I'd, I'd simply want to acknowledge that we, I did take advantage of a uh, NIH GCRC grant some years ago when I did my pilot psilocybin uh, end-of-life anxiety study, and it was a, a, a extremely valuable uh, service to use as it provided a, uh, a dedicated inpatient research unit. Sadly, that, uh, that funding is no longer available. So looking at what's going on in our country, for some years it's been evident that uh, while the uh, rates of uh, mental illness have, continued, have steadily increased, the development of, uh, of novel new novel psychiatric treatments are, have uh, not, not increased uh, accordingly. So we know that rates of substance abuse have uh, risen, suicide rates are rising, and, uh, and the, the, the somewhat old data I'm showing here doesn't even take into account the experiences of the last year where likely we are seeing or will see uh, increasing evidence of a surge in mental health concerns uh, provoked by the COVID pandemic. So basically the problem is, are our standard conventional therapeutic uh, uh, interventions, are they adequate for the task at hand? And should we be considering uh, new models? In fact, are we approaching a point in time where we may consider a paradigm shift is uh, occurring or will occur within psychiatric treatment, a paradigm sh shift both with our conceptualization of disorder and a paradigm shift in regards to our um, uh, treatment models that we might utilize. Uh, Thomas Kuhn, the philosopher of science, of uh, coined this, uh, this term, and uh, he described it as a, a, a rather sudden reequilibration of how we see a problem, how we conceptualize it, and how we can design a solution to problems that arise from it. So I'm very interested in the topic of, uh, of psychedelics, um, but first let's talk, talk about uh, you know, what are they? I'll provide an overview here. Uh, the three primary terms, because there, there is a nomenclature issue and some active debate going on. The, I'd say the most popular term is psychedelic, which uh, translates from the Greek as mind manifesting. And that came out of a famous correspondence in the mid fifties between the British uh, literary figure, Aldous Huxley and the British Canadian uh, psychiatric researcher, Humphrey Osmond. They coined the term psychedelic, but psychedelic has become conflated with the cultural phenomena of the sixties. So when we're talking purely about the range of effects of this class of uh, drug, um, psychedelic kind of, I believe, complicates to some degree. But I do use psychedelic interchangeably with other terms, as you'll see. And theogen, another term, has had some popularity, uh, particularly among those with a theological bent. Uh, it, it translates out as accessing the divine within. The problem here is that not all psychedelic experiences uh, lead to an entheogenic experience. So I've, I've felt entheogen in some cases, perfectly adequate. I did such studies years ago in uh, the Brazilian Amazon in the capital city of Manaus in the state of Amazonas, where we studied the range of effects of ayahuasca in a, <clears throat> in a syncretic church. 
And there, there was clearly a entheogenic model that was at play, but in other contexts, not, not necessarily. Now, hallucinogen is the traditional term, the, uh, the, the oldest term. It, it has been criticized for um, over pathologizing uh, the, um, the phenomena uh, that these drugs induce, but um, uh, hallucinogen um, is, uh, you, you know, I think we need to look beyond that. I mean, in a sense, the, the critique has been the, these compounds don't necessarily uh, create hallucinations per se, and there's some merit to that. But if you look at the derivation, the root of, of the etymological root of the word hallucinogen, it comes from the Latin hallucinari, which translates out as mind journeying, mind wandering, mind voyaging, or tripping, as you will. And I've, I've felt the hallucinogen has advantages, particularly in the medical context. And accordingly, uh, well, on your right, you see a, a host of other terms that have been used over the last hundred years to identify and define these topics. But my, my preference formally has been hallucinogen. So um, here, I'll show you the copy of a book that I'm, I've, I've co-edited that actually is going to be published in, um, in March by Guilford Press. And I, after a lot of consideration, a lot of debate back and forth with some of the contributors to the text, uh, I, I settled on the term hallucinogens as being the most accurate and the most appropriate for, um, for a, uh, a book with a medical orientation. So um, you, you can see the chemical structures for uh, uh, several uh, classic uh, hallucinogens, uh, as well as chemical structure for the neurotransmitter serotonin. And curiously, you can see the close compatibility uh, or similarities but in chemical structure-wise between serotonin and some of the um, uh, classic hallucinogens, particularly psilocin and psilocybin. Psilocin is a metabolite and an analog of psilocybin, um, and it's very close chemically. Yes, serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine, psilocin is 4-hydroxy, and then dimethyltryptamine, psilocybin is 4-phosphoryloxy uh, uh, and, and dimethyltryptamine. So very, very close compatibility. And somehow or other, the, the, the human central nervous system ha has evolved, developing an exquisite sensitivity to be receptive to these very, very potent compounds. LSD, you see down in the bottom right, is potent on a microgram level, one of the most potent drugs known to medical science. So we also know that uh, uh, hallucinogens, particularly LSD, were involved in the discovery of the serotonin neurotransmitter system, particularly the work uh, of Daniel X. Friedman should be credited. He was uh, chair in the, in the 60s at the, and 70s at the University of Chicago and spent the latter years of his life and his career as a professor emeritus at UCLA. So he's quite well known or was quite well known on the UCLA campus for some years. And he made pivotal contributions to our understanding and really to the evolution of our knowledge of uh, of, of the central nervous system. Uh, we know that it's the 5-HT2A receptor, which is primarily uh, affected by classic hallucinogens. We know that because it can be blocked by 5-HT2A blockers like uh, catanserin. And we also know that rapid tolerance and, uh, uh, and down regulation after repeated use uh, uh, occurs uh, at the 5-HT2A receptor. That's why individuals uh, who use hallucinogens tend to do so rather sparingly. So here are some non-classic hallucinogens, which have some interest both from safety orientations as well as, um, as, uh, as, well as uh, compounds that may have some application in, uh, in psychiatric treatments. One compound to point out to uh, as a drug of potential risk is NBOM, a uh, in the 25 uh, I 
class. It's a phenethylamine hallucinogen. It's potent on microgram levels, and it has been used as a drug substitute on blotter paper for LSD, and there have been fatalities. Uh, some of them have been mistakenly attributed to LSD because it was sold and consumed, believing it was LSD, but chemical analyses later confirmed NBOM was the uh, was the drug which caused the fatal reaction. Uh, Salvinorin A comes uh, is the active diterpene isolated from the salvia plant. Uh, the active diterpene Salvinorin A is extremely potent, can cause a very bizarre disorienting experience. Uh, most individuals I know who have tried the pure diterpene have only taken it once because it's too disconcerting. So the plant, the raw plant is used by native peoples of, uh, of Central America, and it's used there as a whole leaf product, watered up, quite a number watered up into a ball, placed in the back of the mouth and allowed to absorb slowly through the uh, buccal mucosa. And, and that's a very different effect than the active diterpene. And then some uh, compounds which have reputed um, a therapeutic use, a lot of interest in ketamine. Uh, I think maybe the um, concerns about ketamine have to do with psychological dependence. I've actually been involved in interventions, taking away uh, ketamine supplies from individuals who could not stop personal use. These include a physician who, um, uh, obtained a, a supply to use in his practice and decided to it's thought to sample it himself and then develop such an affinity for it, he could not leave it alone. So an intervention was necessary. MDMA, 3,4-methylene-doxymethamphetamine, I've done uh, several research projects there, including the first phase one study in the early 90s. I did a study several years ago at Harvard UCLA using an MDMA treatment model for adults on the autism spectrum who have severe social anxiety. We were targeting the social anxiety in a challenging patient population. And finally, Ibogaine, which has evoked some interest as a possible addiction interrupter, particularly in regard to uh, opiates. So uh, many of these compounds uh, derive from plants, psilocybin cubensis, uh, from which psilocybin was first uh, discovered. Um, used in ritual practice throughout uh, Central America and, and as well uh, in prehistoric times in, in, in Europe. Lofofor williamsi is, uh, is peyote, used by Native American church with the sanction of the federal government, as long as participants in uh, peyote ceremonies are one quarter uh, Native American ancestry. And claviceps purpura is a... Uh, derived from a, uh, it's a fungus, an ergot fungus, which grows on rye and has been suggested as the active, uh, psychoactive component of the kikion in, uh, in the ancient Greek rites of Eleusis, uh, where this uh, sacred libation was administered to uh, Greek citizens under the, they were not allowed to talk about their experience in these mass ceremonies under pain of death. and um, but, but archeological finds from Eleusis have identified um, indication of, uh, of lysergamides, uh, LSD type uh, uh, compounds, which are derived from the ergotamine fungus on, on rye. Um, this is, these are the plants that go into the uh, uh, brewing of I, the, uh, <clears throat> Amazonian plant hallucinogen decoction ayahuasca. Uh, I've done research with ayahuasca in Brazil, both in the early 90s and then the early 2000s with uh, uh, adult population, part of the members of the Unión de Vegetal, the UDV syncretic church. In the early 2000s, we were invited back by the Brazilian judiciary to do a study evaluating safety for adolescents who participated with their parents and family ceremonies in the UDV. Uh, ayahuasca has uh, accrued growing interest in the United States and Europe. Um, it, ayahuasca comes from the brewing of two separate plants, which if taken separately, uh, do not evoke any psychoactive effects, but if brewed together in a many hours long, rather complicated process, 
Uh, these plants are Psychotria viridis, which contains the hallucinogen DMT, and the Banisteriopsis copy, which contains harmala alkaloids, which function as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, allowing for activation of the DMT in the Psychotria. And it yields this very powerful brew called ayahuasca, which is of growing interest, uh, not simply in South America, but in North America and throughout the world. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, hallucinogens have been used for many thousands of years in, um, in, in, by indigenous peoples from around the world. Their use has been traced back some 7,000 years uh, to this cave painting on the southern Algerian plain of Tassili. Uh, this is a cave painting. Um, actually, the, it's a sketch done by Kathleen Harrison from the original painting in uh, southern Algeria. And you can see a shaman-like figure with mushrooms uh, uh, coming out, protuberances from the torso and limbs, the beehive mask, uh, honey was a preservative for plant and fungal products. So this is undoubtedly a shamanic figure who has some uh, acquaintance with, uh, with mushrooms and no doubt hallucinogenic mushrooms. So traditionally these compounds have been used for religious and medicinal purposes, <clears throat> rites of initiation by diverse cultures around the world and they've had a profound influence on the evolution of religion, philosophy, and art. So back in the 50s and 60s, when psychedelic drugs first became of interest uh, to uh, Western science, particularly psychiatry, they became widely used uh, for a period of years, mostly late 60s, late 50s through the 60s, um, and uh, Lester Grinspoon and James Bacheller had assessed that in a uh, approximate 15 year period, about a thousand uh, uh, reports uh, uh, described the experiences of some 40,000 patients treated with hallucinogens. So there was a wealth of information available to, uh, to uh, those interested in this area. And I think it's an important literature to examine. They did not utilize the kind of what we consider state-of-the-art research methodologies of today because they were had not been developed very much back then. But the case reports are quite fascinating and very, I think, revealing of the range of effects of these compounds and how to control and harness their, their power for positive end and minimize the likelihood of negative outcome. Here are some of the... Uh, conditions used to treat, that psychedelics were used in treatment. Alcoholism's remarkably positive data and very easy to observe. Either your subject who had a chronic alcohol use problem beforehand, he's either drinking or, he's, or he has stopped drinking. And it's um, and starting with the work of Osmond in the 50s in Canada, going up through the work of Groff, and, uh, and others in the late 60s, even into the early 70s, their outcomes were quite, quite impressive. Other treatment applications include uh, psychosomatic disorders, chronic PTSD. There's some modern PTSD studies being used with MDMA run by an organization called MAPS. Uh, many of these in South Carolina, but now with other sites around the country and in Canada. Uh, OCD, there's a, uh, currently a, um, a study at Yale uh, previously, some work done at University of Arizona. Also, uh, back in the day, antisocial behavior was treated with some interesting report, reported outcomes. Autism, this is a more controversial area. They were treating children back in the 50s. I would not necessarily recommend that in the modern era, but uh, children do grow up. And, uh, you know, adults on the spectrum, we demonstrated with an MDMA model, no reason to think that a hallucinogen model couldn't be similarly effective, that uh, this was a uh, potentially valuable treatment, but certainly needs more, more formal, rigorous investigation. And finally, um, some of the best data from the 60s uh, and in the modern era has been that using a hallucinogen treatment model for the existential anxiety in advanced stage cancer. And I'll spend a little time talking about that towards the end of my talk. 
So looking at um, uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, there are actually two different models that have been used over time. The first is a low, low dose, moderate dose model of uh, psycholytic therapy. And this was very popular in Europe and actually continued, it's, it, it continued to be uh, explored during a time when all psychedelic research had been terminated in the US. In, in Europe in the 70s and into the 80s, a psychiatrist in Germany named Hans Karl Leuner, along with his protege, Michael Schlichting, were quite active investigating and, uh, and publishing. Unfortunately, many of their publications were in German, but they, they did very interesting work with the psycholytic model, a low-dose model, allows for active dialogue between the therapist and the patient, addressing current life challenges, which have been processed in an ongoing psychotherapy. These involve multiple sessions over time, and um, individuals are fully uh, oriented th throughout this process. Now, we need to distinguish this from the more modern iteration of a much lower dose model, which would be the microdose model, and I'll have some comments on that towards the end of my talk as well. Now, psycholytic therapy is, is, is one model of um, using psychedelics in therapy, and the other is the psychedelic model for therapy. This was popularized more in the United States um, by, importantly, the work of Groff, the import, important work of Walter Pankey, and these involved high-dose uh, administration of a psychedelic drug led, can lead to a fully dissociated psychedelic state orientation often re remains preserved, but on occasion, the dissociation is so powerful, there's an element of disorientation. This model is used rather sparingly, only once or a limited number of time o o over, o over time. Um, the patient, it lies down on a couch or, 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 or a bed or a mat on the floor has a eye mask on, has headphones, listening to pre-recorded music, and is instructed to go as deeply as possible into the experience. The dialogue with the therapist is deferred until after the acute effects of the drug have worn off. When we did our psilocybin studies, we would wait for the six hour point to engage with the patient what they had gone through. We would check in every hour while they were in the throes of it, but really just to check a blood pressure, just to check if they were okay, but we did not encourage active dialogue until the effects of the drug had waned and an individual is more able to reflect. And this is an important part of the treatment is to reflect on what just happened. You know, individuals come into a session with some goals, with a intention of working on various issues, of asking particular questions. And it's after the effects have waned that often it becomes apparent what the answers to the therapeutic questions are. So the psychedelic model also involves a deep altered state of consciousness where there's a potential for a mystical experience. And going back to Osmond in the 50s with his work with alcoholics and then Pankey and Groff in the late 60s, early 70s, looking at the use of psychedelics, not only with alcoholics, but also with individuals approaching the end of life, it was evident that those who experienced a full-on mystical level experience were those who had the most positive uh, therapeutic outcomes uh, uh, after treatment in the days, weeks, and months following. So the mystical experience can be a predictor of more positive therapeutic outcome. Very important to look at extra pharmacological variables, particularly that of set and setting. The, the Set is who is that individual who's going to have the experience? What is his or her background? What could be see, perceived with their personality structure? What have they been preoccupied in their thoughts lately? What is their mood going into the experience? What are their expectations? What is the intention? I find it very, very important for individuals who are going for treatment with this model, albeit this is all in a approved research context, but still 
that they really give some serious work and attention to what is their intention? What do they hope to get out of this experience? And then optimally set up study, the a, a, a trained and experienced therapist would work with the patient from the preparatory phase to the actual session, the treatment session, to the uh, follow-up integrative um, therapy uh, uh, involvement. So um, that that's the set. Who is this person going into the experience? The setting is where is it happening? Who is it happening with? What are the con the physical, social, and cultural, environmental context. Very important to have a setting which ensures strong safety parameters. Um, what if someone rings the doorbell so, so, or, or knocks at the door? Someone in, in a uh, clear frame of mind needs to answer that, not, not the patient, not the research subject. So you need, uh, you need trained guides and individuals who are adept at handling whatever may come up uh, in the circumstances of the experience. And very important also uh, in regards to outcome is that it's the understanding that the setting is embedded in a therapeutic context with therapists there, with an environment that's aesthetically pleasing, with, uh, with music that furthers the process, furthers the goals of the uh, of the treatment and then overall the guiding and oversight of the psychedelic experience be conducted by trained capable therapists this is not a time to uh to go cheap and and, and elicit a uh, a a minimally trained uh therapist because they are of lower cost this is this is a uh, a role for an individual with a significant clinical uh experience and acumen Okay, other extra pharmacological variables include the preparation for the treatment session, as I mentioned earlier, really addressing the intention. Why do you want to do this? What do you hope to get out of it? What questions do you have to ask? Is there a healing process you'd like to address? Um, the expectation effects are directed towards predetermined therapeutic goals, you know, looking at intention. The formalized structure of the session, we talked about that in reference to the uh, the setting, often ritualizing this is, uh, I think, of value. One of the early uh, investigators and really authorities in this area, Ralph Metzner, who's a good fr old friend of mine, passed away two years ago, wrote at length about the value of a ritual structure to, uh, to contain these sessions and to optimize safety and optimize the potential for an uh, efficacious therapeutic outcome. Then also there's the induction of the altered state of consciousness, the psychedelic state itself, and then very importantly, the integration, the processing afterwards, the revisiting, what were your intentions? Let's look at those. What came up during the session that might reflect an answer to a question you were asking, and et cetera, and et cetera. So looking at some of the research methodological challenges and limitations, I think this would be interesting to look at. It's certainly been a challenge um, for the field, but the blinding process is, uh, it, it, it can, can, can be uh, somewhat problematic, in part because individuals who have a prior experience with psychedelics, you know, who are familiar with the psychedelic state, uh, can pretty easily unblind themselves. And this is a problem in all of the research studies that um, some individuals are able to, you know, see through the blinding because of the uh, strong effects of the psychedelic drug. Um, uh, also, there is um, not a whole lot of data. We, we need to understand both the acute effects and the chronic dosing effects. So we, we're We've accrued, I think, good data on what happens acutely, but for those individuals who either take a very low dose frequently over time, the microdose model, or those individuals who have taken psychedelics and then you want to evaluate how they may have been impacted far down the line, there's far more limited information there. So we have a there's a lack of data and the blank areas need to be filled in. There's also the issue of patient biases and expectancies. Um, 
that, uh, you know, if individual, like back in the 60s, you'd hear individuals say, well, I'm really afraid of going insane if I take LSD. And then they would take LSD and have a very scary experience, not necessarily go insane permanently, but still have a very disturbing experience. So that was their expectation. And uh, evidently, perhaps they were not a good good choice for this kind of treatment, or there was no preparatory work, but expectation is very important. If you expect to have a powerful psycho-spiritual epiphany leading to therapeutic um, effects, that there's some likelihood that might happen as well. That's why it's really critical when you're preparing to work on intention and, uh, and, and, and really to move your expectations to a more positive direction. Um, so also the generalizability of some of these studies. You know, if you look at the depression literature with psychedelics, you see that most of the data is coming from the uh, treatments of people with advanced cancer, that, these, that depression measures were utilized and you could see the depression measures improve over time. But this doesn't necessarily generalize to individuals who are medically healthy, but have a serious treatment resistant major depression. So there's a problem of generalizability. I often see my data that I generated from our study with, uh, we did the pilot study with advanced cancer patients, but I've seen it cited to justify that there is a role of these drugs to treat uh, depression and depression alone with, with, without medical illness. Now that may well be the case, but we need more data to identify that. To date, the only studies looking at major depression in a medically healthy population have been open label studies and those have limited um, significance compared to a, uh, a, a controlled study. And uh, also we, we do need to work on determining the a true range of risk. The, you know, we, in our studies to date, we screen out individuals who may be at higher risk, individuals with serious um, his, family histories for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, individuals with a history of a psychotic episode themselves, they're generally screened out. And maybe of even more concern are individuals with particular kinds of medical problems are screened out or even above a certain age. Many of the early studies cut off their uh, acceptance into the study at age 65 or 70. They screened out individuals with cardiovascular disease. These are individuals that need to be studied. As the field is moving forward, there's more interest, including among uh, older people, individuals who may have underlying cardiovascular problems, may not even be aware of it. There needs to be further study. I mentioned earlier that the, it's the 5-HT2A receptor, which is primarily uh, having the agonist effect uh, with, with psychedelics. But there's also a 5-HT2B receptor effect. And the 5-HT2B receptor has a role in maintaining the uh, structural integrity of cardiac valves. And there is uh, some concern that a, that, that, that's stimulating or the agonist effect on the, on the 2B uh, receptor could lead to um, uh, cardiac issues over time. This has never been rigorously studied. It really needs to be. This should be a priority is to look at individuals with um, compromised cardiovascular function uh, or even individuals who don't appear to have any cardiac compromise, but that's simply because it hasn't been diagnosed. I'm aware of a case not too long ago of a man in his mid seventies had never taken a psychedelic, purportedly was in good health, arranged after reading a popular book on psychedelics to, um, to have an experience with, uh, with mushrooms. And within an hour after he recruited a guide uh, from the un so-called underground, and this individual uh, expired about an hour, hour and a half into the session, uh, he was found on autopsy to have uh, some cardiovascular issues, but he may not have been aware even that he had cardiac problems. Uh, it's not, not, not beyond the realm of possibility. Many individuals do not take their medical concerns to, uh, 
to get medical workup. So this guy may not have even been aware. But in any event, uh, it's important we look at the, the true range of risk of, of these compounds. So also multiple confounders and biases when recruiting for, for these studies, self-selection of patients. Uh, individuals hear about this through the media, through their social networks, they get very excited. They have positive expectations. The media hypes the positive expectations, and that can skew the, uh, the outcome in a positive way. But still, when you're doing research, this all has to be taken into account. Uh, placebo challenges, there are inert placebos. We've used cornstarch for some of our studies, but active placebos, we've used niacin for other studies. Another, another active placebo besides niacin is a model used at Johns Hopkins, which is very, very low dose psilocybin, but we're learning through the microdose experience that even very, very low dose psilocybin may have an effect. So how effective a placebo is that? Um, and uh, prior exposure to active drug limits the blinding of the condition. I mentioned that earlier. So um, the nocebo effect uh, involves a subject randomized to control condition. Uh, the awareness of that may lead to profound disappointment, which could eventuate in the deterioration of psychiatric system symptoms with increased hopelessness and depression. If an individual in one of these end of life studies who has limited time, who um, is administered a placebo, is aware that becomes aware that it's a placebo, and if the treatment model does not call or the subject's not aware that he, he might on a subsequent occasion receive the active drug, it could lead to intense acute demoralization with uh, deterioration of status. So the, so the effects of placebo in that regard also have to be taken into account because that can skew data with your placebo sessions being more negative than um, increasing the negativity for those sessions. So I hope this is, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide. I hope it's uh, readable. I'll walk you through it quickly. But this is from a very, very good review article by Leah Mertens at uh, Heidelberg University and Katrine Preller, a friend of mine who's at University of Zurich. They, they did an excellent uh, review article on this topic in a journal called uh, Pharmacopsychiatry, uh, just in the, released in the last couple of months. But th this is a review of uh, many of the cases, um, rather many of the uh, studies utilized with classic psychedelics. Uh, first, uh, the Johnson study at Hopkins looking at cigarette addiction uh, got remarkably good results. It, it, unfortunately, it was open, open label, so uh, the methodology could be improved. And, and even though this was published seven years ago, disappointing that the only follow-up have come from the same research group. We, we need corroboration of these findings from other uh, separate independent groups. Uh, Mike Bogenschutz, uh, formerly at New Mexico, now at NYU, has done some very good work following up on the early Osmond and Graf work on treating alcoholics. Um, and, uh, and their early work, again, open label, which limits, I think, what you can conclude, nevertheless, uh, they got some excellent results, often having to push higher dosages curiously in their alcoholic patients. Uh, Carhart Harris at Imperial College London did a study, psilocybin treating major depression. However, this is an open label study and, uh, and, and that's problematic. Uh, I, I think, the, again, these with all the limitations of a uh, placebo model, that, that's our gold standard. That's what we have to use, including for uh, looking at the effects of psilocybin with major depression. Uh, ayahuasca has been used in Brazil, uh, some, at least some studies to uh, treat uh, uh, depression. Um, a limited study just looking at a 21 day follow-up period. And then there were uh, several studies looking at the use of a classic hallucinogen to treat uh, the anxiety, existential anxiety and demoralization associated with advanced stage cancer. We did the first at Harbor UCLA some years ago using a modest dose. Uh, we, we had, it was a, a double blind placebo control. Subjects were their own controls, so they would be given a, a, a treatment session uh, 
on one occasion, and then a month later, they would get another treatment session, and the whether it was active drug or placebo would be reversed, but they were blinded as to the order. They knew they would get one of each, but they were blinded to the order, as were the treatment staff, including me. Um, a, a, a somewhat similar study using LSD in Switzerland by Peter Gosser uh, was uh, conducted uh, also with a limited number of patients. Then there were uh, two larger scale studies done in the US, the first by uh, Steve Ross, who used the niacin placebo, same as I did. We actually gave our protocol to the NYU group uh, and Steve and Tony Bosses, and they adapted it to their use. They had permission from the FDA to go with a slightly higher dose that we had permission for. And then Hopkins, um, Roland Griffiths, uh, uh, Matt Johnson, Bill Richards, Mary Casamato, uh, use a, an even higher dose model and uh, with a low dose psilocybin placebo, which I think is somewhat problematic, but that was their placebo. And finally, a, a, a more recent study done in, again in Brazil, looking at depression in an inpatient population, but they only did their um, uh, follow-ups of depressive status for seven days, which is very, very limited. I think a great opportunity was was missed. This was a, uh, a placebo control. They claimed they came up with a uh, an ayahuasca placebo, which tasted as horrible as real ayahuasca. I'd have to see that to believe it, but that's what they say. And uh, But they had some good preliminary results, but these were quite preliminary. And then finally, a, a, um, a, a study again at Hopkins using a waiting list control and looking at the treatment of, um, of, of depressive. John K. Davis was the lead author here. And again, this could be seen in more detail, the Mertens and Preller review article in pharmacopsychiatry just published recently. So um, power, back to the paradigm shift. Our conventional psychopharmacology, which can be given with or without adjunctive psychotherapy, um, involves the administration of a, uh, a drug for weeks, for months, for years. It, it posits a uh, kind of a, uh, a chronic uh, microbiological or chronic neurobiological deficit and that has to be chronically treated for extended periods of time. It ameliorates a presumed pathologic brain state and uh, relief of symptomatology is not dependent on patient's attitude or any insight that may be derived from, uh, from treatment. That's the paradigm we've been working with since really since the, since the mid late seventies. Uh, and, uh, and it, it can we look at some at, at a new paradigm is really the question before us. For decades, the regulatory agencies were very reluctant to, to sanction such research studies because of the cultural and political upheaval of the 60s. But since the early 90s, when our group at Harbor and uh, groups at New Mexico and University of Miami got phase, permission to do phase one studies, the FDA has become increasingly receptive and supportive and even helpful in getting these studies off of the ground. So that allows us to take a look at an alternative paradigm, the psychedelic uh, psychopharmacology paradigm where a drug need be only administered on one occasion only or so on a few occasions separated over time. It uh, loses defenses, uh, facilitates insight. Individuals lie down on, on, on a couch, eye shades, headphones on, go as deeply as possible. Whereas I should, you, you know, we talked about that before, very carefully monitored. You see in the picture, aesthetically pleasing room, your, your, your therapeutic male-female dyad right there to address any issues that may, may come up. And it's within the context of a psychotherapy, a psychothera psychotherapeutic process, which uh, starts as, as soon as an individual is accepted it to the study. So a lot of preparatory therapy, the actual being with the patient while they're going through the experience, and then the, um, the follow-up integrative therapy later on. So my last slide here, uh, future challenges. Uh, this picture here, mushroom stones from Central America, many, many hundreds of years, many centuries old. 
And uh, they're kind of looking over us, making sure that since we're now embarking on studying these compounds again, after really after our, our culture took a several century long hiatus, we, refusing to even acknowledge their, dis, their existence and when identifying it, expunging it uh, very vigorously using draconian policies. But there is a lot to learn, a lot to learn from really the, the, sh the indigenous people going way back in time who utilize shamanic models. Um, also, there's a lot to be learned from the pioneer generation of investigators in our culture in the 50s and the 60s who made a number of remarkable discoveries and, uh, and many of them were gifted writers and have some really wonderful articles and books that they're passing down to us that we could learn from and learn the lessons of the past and uh, move this field forward. First and foremost, as we move this field forward, essential to optimize uh, safety parameters and, and also be very attentive to ethics. If we don't have strong safety parameters and if our ethical structures break down, this field will go off the rails uh, once again. So this is really critical. We need to prioritize public health implications. I mean, how will our research studies impact what's going on in the outside world? We, we certainly do not want to see a repeat of the 60s where large numbers of very young people, often teenagers, would take these compounds often in high dose, often mixing with other compounds, no supervision, no preparation, no good understanding, and often get themselves into a great deal of trouble. We need to be attentive to proper messaging. And, and, and I believe identifying and positioning this treatment at, really as treatment, as a treatment for indications that are refractory and non-responsive to conventional therapies. These are not safe recreational drugs, in, in, in my opinion, over the long haul, and we need to be still active in addressing this. There's the issue of microdosing, and I, I think I mentioned earlier that, um, well, the problem, with my, there's a lot of excitement about microdosing. Um, these are exceedingly small doses taken, let's say, every few days, for a month and then a break and then going through it again. There's a lot of very positive uh, reports on this. However, there as yet has been no placebo control uh, study, which you really would need to assess true safety and efficacy for the microdosing model. And I, I'm also concerned that there may be some cardiac uh, issues here that are not being attended to. Uh, in regards to the chronic pulsing, the, the, the chronic stimulation of the 5-HT2B uh, receptor by the microdose of the psychedelic, either LSD or people sometimes use mushrooms, which aren't measurable because their, their, their concentration of active alkaloids can vary from batch to batch. Also in the field of psychedelic research, we certainly need greater diversity. We, we need more women to take leadership roles in this field. There's been a surprising lack of uh, really of, of women investigators that's beginning to change that really needs, we need to trend in the future, getting women more involved, including in leadership roles. Uh, also people of color are, are not represented adequately, both as, uh, as, as, as research staff, as therapists, as doctors, or as subjects. These are generally studies administered by, uh, you know, whites and subjects uh, are, are generally have been Caucasian as well. That may reflect the patterns we've observed in the 60s that psychedelics were of lesser interest to people of color than they were to more affluent Caucasian populations. N nevertheless, we need to uh, address these uh, diversity issues. The, the regulatory system, I, you know, I started out in this field uh, applying for research permission in the early 90s. I was told the regulatory agencies would be very hostile. They, they would be very resistant. That has not been my, my experience at all. I've found them very collegial, very professional, very receptive to talking with me. They have never approved a protocol I've presented you know, as, as I presented it, they all, they had a lot of critiques. 
There was a lot of back and forth and I had to make a lot of adjustments in my protocols. But at the end of the day, the protocol was improved. So I was appreciative of the, the input and the expertise that was provided to me by the FDA and the DEA reviewers as well. And also in California, I should mention, you've got the Research Advisory Panel of California. So a number, number of regulatory uh, uh, hurdles you have to jump over, but at the end of the day, the experience, it, it, it just takes time, patience, persistence. It's workable. You, it, It's not a obstacle that cannot be navigated. Now there's the issue of funding. I got to spend a minute on this. <clears throat> In the past, uh, all the research I've done, we've um, We've uh, really funded it on a, uh, uh, you know, with with limited funding. Uh, I've often, uh, I've often worked as have some of my colleagues pro, pro bono on, on these studies. In the last few years, however, there has been an influx of a lot of private money into this field. Then there is increasing indication that the field of psychedelic treatment is being commercialized. And I have some concerns over this um, because uh, commercial ventures are out to make a profit. There are increasing for-profit uh, companies here. And um, uh, to optimize your profit, you need to minimize your costs. So what's going to happen with the necessary uh, safety container you are creating to treat your patients in, in terms of having well-trained, highly experienced, well-credentialed um, therapists and facilitators, as opposed to getting someone with minimal uh, experience, minimal clinical expertise. I think as a, as a minimum, individuals doing this work need to have a clinical license, which infers they've gone through a clinical training program at, where they've had a lot of clinical supervision. So we need to develop standards or the regulatory system will need to develop standards in that regard. But I, I, I would, I'm maintaining some kind of vigilance and kind of just monitoring what's going on out in the commercial commercialization fee area with this field. And uh, it's something we do need to uh, pay attention to. There's growing access to these compounds, both within um, research studies, as well as in certain municipalities, which have in the last uh, year or two have gone ahead and essentially decriminalized some of these compounds. That includes the city of Denver, the city of Oakland, the city of Santa Cruz, and then a few months ago, the state of Oregon. California may have this on the, on the ballot coming up, and uh, we need to be ready for it. And I think, you know, there are some concerns here. There are some concerns about uh, about safety and and how is the public at large who's going to have open access presumably to these contexts? Uh, you know, uh, how how are they going to be educated as to um, how to minimize risk in in moving forward? How will therapists who want to do this work going to be credentialed and how are they? going their their function going to be monitored so look at the end of the day this is an exciting field we've made a since i started out in the early 90s kind of well, actually i started in the late 80s writing in the early 90s doing research in this area the field has come a, 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 a great distance it's now possible to talk about it it was, it was very hard even to be open about this topic it, it, speaking in, in, in the past there's a lot of enthusiasm a lot of excitement. There's a sense that this could actually be a, a new and uh, and in certain contexts, a more effective treatment paradigm. But we're going to have to be smart. We're going to have to be very attentive to issues surrounding safety parameters and ethical parameters. And we do need to be vigilant and to monitor the growing influence of commercial entities on the field and on our, 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 our treatment models and our treatment process. So that's that's my talk. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present on a topic which I have all found for many years very compelling, quite fascinating, and now very exciting as we're moving forward in time. And I'm hoping to see more research in the future. Let me final word just to say, I think there's great opportunity moving forward for young investigators or, or people in training who would like to be investigators. After 
you know, decades of suppression and no activity whatsoever, there's a lot of lost time we need to make up for. So um, and again, these are fascinating compounds. And as long as we do our due diligence and uh, address uh, safety and ethics uh, properly and also be careful about the encroachment of uh, the commercial uh, realm, I think this is a field that should be with us for some time and should be a very valuable part of our um, uh, of the kinds of treatments we can deliver as uh, as mental health professionals. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Grobe, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, I'd like to also welcome our trainees. Uh, we have um, our residents joining us who are part of the uh, residency uh, interest group in psychedelics. So thanks for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. And before I forget, I want I want to plug his book. So mine came in the mail last week, um, just published, uh, I think probably just came out like a week or two ago. Uh, I predict that this will become the definitive reference uh, for a psychedelic hallucinogen. So you, you heard it here first. All right, uh, let's see, Dr. Grobe. Um, oh, there you go. All right. Okay. Good to see you. Okay. All right. So um, for those of you not familiar with our system, please use the uh, Q&A box to enter your questions. And uh, let's... Uh, Let's start. So I wanted to start uh, off with a question about the uh, psychotherapy component of, of these treatments. And you, um, you know, you focus on the importance of establishing intent and goals of treatment. What degree of psychological insight do you think is required is necessary from the patient? Uh, so for example, um, you know, in, in the pre-drug um, uh, therapies, you, you're asking them, okay, you know, what's, what, what do you want to kind of gain from this treatment? And, you know, you can certainly imagine a, a patient who would say, I, I just don't want to feel depressed, right? Uh, that would be one scenario. A second scenario might be a patient who could say, well, I understand there's events that have happened in my past and pr probably maybe my current situation that are contributing to my depression. I want to better understand um, why, it, why it's doing that and how to overcome them. And then you might have a, a very insightful patient saying that, you know, I understand that I, I, I experienced a lot of abuse when I was a child. I know that's contributing to my depression. I feel a lot of guilt over it, um, feeling that uh, I was somehow responsible. I know I'm not responsible. I, I want to know how to um, address this guilt that is, I think, contributing to my depression. So um, in your experience, what is, is, a, is a degree of psychological insight necessary for, for this to work? I, I, th I think it's helpful. I think the degree to which someone is self-aware <laughs> to begin with put, puts them a, a leg up, but that doesn't mean that someone who's never had any therapy is not self-reflective by nature, couldn't receive uh, tr tremendous value. I, I've, I've spent some time looking through old uh, videos and transcripts of some of the old uh, alcoholism treatment studies. And, uh, and many of these individuals, you know, you, you, you ne never had any psychotherapy. Some of them were from lower socioeconomic strata. We're, we're, we're not prone to self-examination, but they still had, many of them, excellent outcomes. And, and, and I think in some respects, not distinguishable from those who may have been in various therapies for, for some years. Thanks. So on a related point, so you mentioned in the presentation um, that the, the mystical experience predicts uh, a, a therapeutic outcome. Um, you know, looking back at those transcripts, um, how I guess what's the importance of the the patient being able to relate that experience to some event or experience in their life? So, for example, um, a patient during the drug session is able to gain some insight into a past trauma and perhaps has a better uh, understanding of why that happened. Versus a patient, perhaps, you know, maybe there's not quote unquote trauma, but uh, they get a better appreciation for all the positive aspects in their life, right? So you've got a patient on one hand who kind of understands why the trauma happened. You, on the other hand, you have a patient maybe who, um, uh, again, appreciates kind of the positive aspects of their life. And then maybe a third scenario where a patient is able to say, yeah, it was a really intense experience, but I, I can't relate it to anything that is, is current in my life or that's happened in the past. Do, do you think that's a, a predictor of a response kind of based off of, um, again, kind of past, uh, past um, well, you, you, patients? You're talking about those who've had the kind of the psycho-spiritual? 
Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, if, if, if they, had, they had an intense experience, but right. um, oh, yeah. some patients I, are able to relate to their there, lives and some patients aren't. There, there does seem to be something special about, about this mystical level experience. And, and this has been noted, Doug, going back to Osmond in the 50s who treated alcoholics. Also, Pankey and Groff in the late 60s identified those individuals who had at some core point during the course of their many hour session had a mystical flash, had some kind of... Uh, you know, sp strong spiritual experience. They were the ones who seemed to, to predictably do better over time. You know, they, they were the ones who, let's say if, if it was an alcohol treatment study, they were the ones to establish and maintain sobriety. If it was a uh, terminal cancer study, those would be the, one, the individuals who perhaps came to terms more effectively with the, the finitude of life, with the, the fact that they were approaching an end point. So, 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 so something in particular with these compounds and their, their rather unique facility to under uh, you know, optimal conditions in, catalyze mystical experience it seems to be in and of itself quite therapeutic. Can you talk about the, the other side of the missile experience? I guess the, the, the flashback or the, the, the bad trip. Um, you know, not what, necessarily the mystical experience. Yeah, the mystical experience right. might represent the an optimal Kind the, kind the positive of valence, correct. But some people could get stuck in very, very uh, frightening places. Some people could start to feel they are, um, they're losing their minds. And, uh, you know, fears of uh, insanity. Can, it's often transient. It often runs its course. Uh, individuals, when we saw this back in the 60s, who, and these were out, out in the, the, the general public, the population at large, who had a... Um, uh, uh, a, a psychotic, what was described as a psychotic experience, these were generally transient and, and resolved over time. Most often, most often within the course of the session. Occasionally, somebody would have an intractable psychotic state. These were individuals who appeared to have a lot of pre existing vulnerability, both in terms of their, their, their own mental health history or perhaps uh, first degree uh, biological family members. So that's why we've, we rule out individuals with schizophrenia who've had, you know, been diagnosed with schizophrenia or even those who have a first degree family member if we felt it was an accurate diagnosis. So on a related note, how, how necessary, how important is it for us to perhaps develop a mechanism to terminate the, um, you know, using drugs to terminate that, uh, that drug experience. So um, there, I, I saw recently that there is a, a company doing a phase one study looking at the cancer and for treatment or to see if they could terminate the LSD, the effects of LSDs. So you mentioned that pre-treated with the cancer and blocks LSD, but here they're looking to see if once you've given someone LSD, can you terminate that effect? Yeah. For but, psilocybin, my impression is that the, the, uh, the experience is a little bit less intense. So is the psychotherapeutic container enough for that? You, you usually, and I, and I actually, this is a good point because I, I, I think I may have seen the same article that came out, mm -hmm. you know, positing that uh, catanser may have a role to interrupt bad trips. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, um, theoretically, yeah, perhaps. Uh, we, we know in normal volunteer studies, when they were exploring, you know, re receptor effects, catanserin was identified. I mean, that's how the 5 ht 2 a theory was established really because catenter, a, a two-way blocker, stopped the experience. So, it, you know, it may have a role. It's it's never been used in a clinical treatment study. Uh, most likely, certainly it will now, especially by this company that's interested in, in uh, filing a patent on the use of catenterin as a treatment interrupter. But in a in, in, in a research or treatment study where you ha you've done your due diligence with proper screening and, and, and preparation and optimal facilitation, there, generally speaking, there should not be a need for mm -hmm. the administration of a, a drug like catanserin to stop the experience cold. There may also be something to be said about in, in the context of a, uh, of a ther therapeutic setting to be allowed the latitude to work through whatever it was that was creating the anxiety. So uh, you, you certainly seen some sessions where it, it appears that the, the patient is having quote unquote a bad trip, but then they're able to kind of work through that. Yeah, in, 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 in my research studies, all, all you know, there, there may have been 
tr points of transient anxiety, but they mm. generally resolve fairly quickly. And in my understanding of other studies in this country and, and, and in Europe, the, the, the incidence of a, uh, of, of a severe sustained psychotic reaction is, is very, very low. In fact, you know, surveys of the research done in the 50s and the 60s by Sidney Cohen and later by Rick Strasman identified that uh, the, 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 the frequency of a serious sustained adverse reaction was, was very, very low. Now, that, that being said, I, I also know, know of accounts, let's say in the world of ayahuasca, where there's a fair degree of uncontrolled use. People are going down to the Amazon looking for experiences. You know, these individuals aren't not necessarily screened very well. Mm -hmm. The oversight is not always optimal. I, there I've seen some individuals come back and have some sustained uh, problems with uh, just with anxiety regulation, mood regulation, and, and also reality testing. Not, 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 not common, but I have seen those cases. But I would say those occurred in suboptimal settings where there was not, 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 not sufficient uh, screening and, uh, and oversight of what was going oversight. on. All right. So let's get to some of the uh, um, participant questions. So uh, Dr. Race asked, uh, patients have asked me where they can get access to psychedelics for use in psychotherapy. What should I tell them? Oh, <laughs> be patient. <laughs> Be patient. I, I, I mean, I get these inquiries all the time, and uh, you know, I have a, um, you know, I have a rule. I, I, I do not refer to the underground. It's just too mm. unpredictable, and mm. also, I'm not that tapped into who's doing this kind of work. I will inform people of active studies or even planned studies, but not beyond that. Now, if someone says I'm depression or my friend is depressed and I, I want to get into a study, I, there are two active studies or active multi-site studies going on now generated by the private sector, one by a company called Compass Pathways, another by uh, the USONA Institute. Uh, the Compass is a for-profit, USONA is a not-for-profit. They both have similar protocols designed to treat refractory depression with a, uh, a psilocybin treatment model. So I'll, I'll refer to those websites, but generally not, not be, or if it's someone with an alcohol problem, I refer them to Bogan shoots at NYU, mm -hmm. yeah, depending on what they're, if there's a clinical presentation or not. Right. For, for those two, um, for the Compass and the USONA, my, my understanding, if I, if I recall correctly, one of them is for treatment resistant depression. And I think maybe the other one is actually just for regular depression. So maybe wow. what's your thought on this um, being applied when it once approved you know, being used in a population that hasn't tried, you know, our, our, yeah, our first no, or I, second line I, treatments. I, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I'm not an advocate for this being a first line treatment. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I would have advised to, that they, 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 they study refractory depression, treatment mm -hmm. resistant depression. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find the, the the greatest potential value of this psychedelic treatment model are, are with uh, conditions that do not respond well to conventional treatments. You know, for instance, alcoholism is a, a great example of that. Modern medicine still struggles as, as it did decades ago with finding effective treatment for people with alcohol abuse. The data starting in the 50s and now up to modern times is very impressive and can't be ignored. And um, so I see that as a, uh, and, and conventional treatments often get you nowhere. We have a question about personality traits and how they track with efficacy and outcome of treatment. In particular, um, the question was, they were wondering if, if a person with a high degree of neuroticism are more prone to experience difficulties um, with the resultant openness that may result. Not, not, not necessarily. They might mm -hmm. find themselves tied up in knots during the actual experience, but with mm -hmm. good, good guidance and good facilitation, mm -hmm. they should be able to unravel and get back on track. And, uh, mm -hmm. and afterwards, there's this phenomena of, it's been called the afterglow. For, mm -hmm. for days, even weeks, some, some may say even months, individuals are, have enhanced mood, less anxiety, less mm -hmm. prone to their neurotic predilections. Um, so clearly, even for individuals who are very tightly wrapped, 
you know, a, a good treatment session can lead to, you know, therapeutic outcome that can sustain. That's why I think the beauty of this treatment is to some degree is that you can observe a sustained treatment over time. For, compare it to ketamine, interesting compound, ha, ha, has a role in treating depression, but by and large, the reports are after a week or two, the antidepressant effect fades. And then maybe you need to repeat the experience again. With a well-run psilocybin uh, experience in a, in, a, in a properly selected patient, properly prepared patient, you, 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 you might see a, a positive therapeutic impact just sustained over an extended, well beyond the one to two weeks of uh, ketamine. I'd actually be interested in developing a head-to-head -head trial of psilocybin hmm. versus ketamine, given all the, uh, the buzz around each of these now. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you mentioned this kind of afterglow, and one of my questions was about the, um, the timing of that integration session, the, the post-drug integration session. Do you feel that there is an optimal window um, uh, during which that integration, integration session should take place? Like, you shouldn't wait too long. No, you're um, right. You're right. You, you shouldn't wait too long. I mean, there needs to be a, a, a good discussion at, at the tail end of the actual session. And then there should be opportunity to kind of reconvene, get together again, either in person or on the phone or a video hookup within a few days for your, your next follow-up session. And then perhaps additional sessions can be spaced out a little bit further. Okay. But you do, it's really helpful for an individual to, to articulate what shortly after the experience, what it was they experienced. Mm. I often advise people, journal this, write it afterward when you go home tonight, you know, write it down, write down as much as you can remember, reflect back to what your intention was going in. What were the questions? What were your, your hopes? H how were those addressed during the course of the many hour session? Talking about it shortly thereafter or writing it down can help you retain that, that memory of the experience. And I think it, it could be used you know, to, 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 to greater value that way. So it sounds like potentially um, one of the main kind of purposes of integration is to um, increase the, the 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 robustness of the the, the long term effect that oh, absolutely. perhaps yeah 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 absolutely to you know to really help reinforce the therapeutic impact but also mm -hmm. to troubleshoot make sure there 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 is no lingering issues or concerns that that should be addressed or clarified right away perhaps someone had a uh, had, had a vision and it's not clear if it was, um, you know, how relevant it was, how real it was. Talking about it afterwards, that later that day at the end of the session or the next day or the day after that can help clarify that point and that could be of value. Could you ever imagine uh, the regulatory agencies supporting a, a dismantling study where you have different arms um, that exclude different parts of the therapy. For example, just preparatory, maybe one with just the in-drug sessions uh -huh. and maybe one with just integration, just to see kind of how each of those phases is uh, contributing to both efficacy and safety. Uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 I look at this as a pack, the treatment as a package. Mm. And that's an, that involves good screening, preparation, good facilitation, good integration. Mm. I, 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 you know, if I was advising the regulatory agency, I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to see a study like that because that, that could also uh, enhance risk. And right. beyond, above and beyond anything else, I'm, I'm very risk averse. So minimization of risk is kind of the, the lead thrust mm. of my, my approach. And, and so I know the um, the studies, at least, yeah, the FDA kind of approved studies. They they require two guides or monitors kind of in the in the room during the drug sessions. But for the integration, uh, just having one one therapist is sufficient. What one, one is fine. Two, two would be fine. fine too. But what one, one, mm. one is per perfectly fine as long as mm. that individual. I think it's important. There's some continuity of who the personnel are. Mm. I, I've seen some descriptions written up by private companies how to lessen costs by getting a, 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 a lower level, lower credentialed individual to do, let's say, the, the screening or the, um, or, or, or the preparation or some other facet. I, I think that, that could be problematic. Yeah, that, that was actually one of my questions. The, the importance of uh, having the, you know, the same personnel present, right? We talk about one of, one of, uh, as one of the greatest kind of predictors of 
response to psychotherapies is it's really the relation, you know, the, the patient right. therapist relationship. And so if you're, if you're switching out uh, across these three phases, I imagine that's- I, I think it'd be confusing for the patient. And, and then your, your fill-in therapist may not have all the information he or she needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that could put the, the treatment process at risk. I, I think continuity over time with the, uh, with the therapist or the therapist mm -hmm. it, it, it is important. So we have one question about uh, how does or how would a clinician get trained to use these interventions? Uh, okay, so um, there is actually a formal training program that's up and running at a uh, graduate school of psychology in San Francisco. It's the uh, California Institute for Integral Studies. They've been running now five or six years. In the past, I've, I've, I've given lectures. I think it's a pretty well-run program. There's limitations to what they can do. I mean, there, there's a case to be made that... Uh, a, a psychedelic therapist having their own firsthand experience is of value. You know, it's hard to guide someone over terrain that you have never been through yourself, but the program at CIIS really cannot legally provide such an experience and really no one can. So, so uh, this is an issue that's being presented to the FDA to create training programs. MAPS is another um, uh, organization that has their own MDMA training program. And I believe they have had um, some success with uh, the FDA to get approval to, um, for, for, for therapists in their program to, to have a firsthand experience. Interesting. So yeah, I think that's one of the, going to be the, one of the major questions when uh, these uh, treatments are approved. So the FDA likes to say, you know, they are not in the business of regulating the practice of medicine and, and psychotherapy falls under that uh, domain. And so, you know, I guess the, the only other mechanism available to regulate, you know, type of training or to even have a psychotherapist there is, is, is the REMS program. And that falls under kind of the, 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 the safety umbrella. So yeah, do you have any predictions as far as how they're going to ensure that you have, number one, that you actually have therapy uh, as part of this treatment? And number two, that you're going to have quality trained therapists? Well, I mean, th this is um, this is a real challenge for, for for FDA to come up with an effective uh, system of, of of regulating this treatment and uh, providing some uh, really some some input as to how to establish a credentialing process. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there, th this is being, I believe, prioritized as an issue at FDA. There's a, there's a big meeting coming up where a number of investigators. And even business entities are being invited all, all to meet together. So there are people at the FDA who are taking, who see this as a, a very important issue and are taking, taking active steps to really address the kinds of questions that you, you've raised, all, all of which are very good and all of which are part of their agenda as to what needs to be addressed. Now, the other big challenge is how are they going to deal with Oakland, with Santa Cruz, with mm. Denver, with the state of Oregon, maybe next year the state of California? That's maybe that's even a bigger problem. What, what kind of regulations will be at play there? Because the ballot initiatives have really opened this up by decriminalizing. Along the lines of the kind of the FDA and their, their approach, my impression just from talking to colleagues is that kind of their, their initial stab at it was to kind of combine kind of psilocybin and MDMA kind of all together under this kind of one umbrella as far as these are the regular, these are the kind of safety mechanisms that meet, need to be in place. But now that they thought about it, maybe a little more thoughtfully is that, you know, th these are not, the effects are not identical, right? That oh, no. perhaps um, the, the safety requirements for one, you know, should not apply or do not apply to the, to the other. Any, any sense of that? Well, I, uh, well, for instance, with MDMA, I, you need more vigilance uh, regarding cardiovascular effects because you mm -hmm. can, uh, someone who is um, prone, someone maybe who has untreated hypertension, you know, MDMA has a stimulant component to the mm -hmm. chemical structure Th this could be very dangerous. Whereas uh, psilocybin, you need to monitor it. I, my concern with psilocybin was the potential of uh, dangerous cardiac arrhythmias. Mm. You know that that that's my concern there. But um, yeah, you 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 would have to develop an individualized approach and not fully understand range of effects of each of these different compounds. And there's going to be more, I think, that are going to be coming 
forward, you know, are getting permission from FDA to be looked at research-wise. DMT is an example. There was a phase one study many years ago by Rick Strausman, and now there's quite a bit of interest in maybe generating some new studies, also with 5-methoxy DMT, which is even more potent. And again, my, I, I've got concerns about cardiovascular effects. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to focus in on that. Um, and just the, um, you know, MDMA is, you, you utilize the MDMA effect during the actual session because it, it really facilitates articulation, articulating mm -hmm. feelings. It's great mm -hmm. for people who are alexithymic without mm -hmm. words for feelings. It's got this rather unique capacity to really help individuals articulate what they're mm -hmm. feeling. Psilocybin, higher dose psilocybin, it, it's quite visionary and you don't want to get you don't want to get distracted with just chat chattering away. You want to go deep into the experience and just mm. allow whatever's going to happen to mm. happen. And I, so they, it calls for a somewhat different approach. So, and you mentioned uh, along the lines of that, the, the psycholytic model. Um, so there you mentioned that the, the patients aren't as altered as they are at, the, at higher doses. So does the, does the therapy, does the conversation there look like distinctly different than a, a yeah. psycholytic model? Yeah, I mean, the, the patient really has model? to do yeah. a, a, a strong reflection if they're experiencing anything at all. You know, microdose means really it's, it's a tiny dose and some individuals will say not aware of any effects. Others will um, talk about sensory enhancement, like going mm. out into a park and suddenly the trees are more vivid. They, 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 they may feel a, a greater sense of connectedness to, to nature around them, maybe a greater sensitivity to, to others. So that, that would be more the microdose. But some individuals will say, I, I, I really don't feel anything. That's why there, there really needs to be a, a double-blind placebo control study to really ferret out what's, uh, what's a real microdose effect and what just may be wishful thinking. Huh, interesting. Uh, we've got a, a more kind of 50,000 foot level question here. How do you envision these therapies being integrated into the US healthcare system? And the second question is, would an inpatient setting, perhaps with maybe an acute exacerbation uh, of symptoms be, be appropriate? Oh, um, actually, give me the top of the question again. Oh, the first question is just, how do you envision these therapies yeah. being integrated into the U.S. healthcare system? Yeah, this is going to be a challenge. I, I, I mean, it's um, who's going to have access? Is it going to be a treatment for upper middle class Caucasians? Mm -hmm. or, is it, or, or is it going to be opened up in the public sector for individuals, uh, people of color, low, low SEC? I think that's a significant issue in, in the world we live in moving forward, that there be provisions made to provide access to individuals who may not be able to afford a, uh, a pricey treatment. And in terms of an inpatient unit, you're talking mm -hmm. about um, treating someone who has had a, an acute decompensation who's, mm -hmm. well, you know, again, it, there, there are a lot of variables that go into that. You know, if they're acutely psychotic, I would definitely hold off. Right. You know, well, what, yeah, what about an acute a candidate? They may, or, or yeah. if so, they may need to reconstitute and, and mm -hmm. do a long preparation for a treatment like this. Uh, we have a question about the, the role of the 5-HT2A signaling in quote unquote active coping. So the, uh, the registrants referring to uh, Carhart Harris and David Nutt's uh, theory that um, signaling is through this uh, receptor seems to be the mechanistic vein for how serotonergic hallucinogens like psilocybin may be beneficial. And, and they wanted to know uh, what your thoughts about how this could contribute to the mechanism of action of atypical antipsychotics, perhaps even contributing to the persistence of negative symptoms even after clinical stabilization. Yeah, I'm not sure. Corrin Harris is, I think, more known for his default mode uh, mm. approach to this. I think there's still some controversy. The, mm. the other part of the question, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I, I, I have a good answer. <laughs> Um, question about concomitant medication. So, you know, these are going to be patients who, like you said, are treatment resistant. And so they're probably not going to come to us once this is approved, uh, you know, clean of medications. But now for all these studies, my, my impression is that that's actually an exclusion factor, that patients need to come off at least some of the serotonergic agents. Right. What are your thoughts on kind of interaction between psilocybin, MDMA, and, and our, our kind of um, but yes, we noted some time ago that um, individuals on SSRIs, if they, they're administered um, 
MDMA or, or, or psilocybin to have an attenuation of the effect of the MDMA or, or the psychedelic. Hmm. So it, 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 so it, you know, doesn't allow the uh, subject to have the full range of experience. So that's problematic. Also, um, an MAOI could be deadly. Someone mm -hmm. who's administered MDMA. In fact, there was an article in uh, the, an internal medicine journal many, many years ago called um, The Agony After Ecstasy. And it was of a, <laughs> a man who was um, uh, on uh, an, an MAOI who took uh, ecstasy, which is a, another term for MDMA, mm -hmm. who had a whopping... Uh, hypertensive crisis landed in mm. the, uh, as I recall, the emergency room at San Francisco General and was mm. lucky to, 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 to come out of that alive. So mm. you wanna be careful there. Also, um, I did a paper in the late 90s with a, a colleague from Finland where we pulled together some case material on individuals who um, were on SSRIs and were then administered, then took ayahuasca and they had for what appeared to be a serotonin syndrome, which was you know, extremely, they got very disoriented, con confused, somewhat out of control. They, they overheated, a lot of tre tremulousness. It was a, a very, very unpleasant experience, both for the, uh, the individual going through it and, and every, everyone around them, because these are generally group <laughs> ceremonies. And it was, right. uh, from what I was told, it was a, a long night. I mean, the individuals, <laughs> were contained, they, 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 they slowly returned to, to baseline status, mm. found it a very sobering experience. <laughs> and uh, I actually felt they got something out of it, but no one would, wanted to repeat that. that that's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, because that, that, that reflected a potential for, me, for medical danger. Right, right. All right, we're at 1.30. I want to thank Dr. Charles Grobe for a fascinating presentation and a, a very thoughtful uh, question and answer session and all our registrants for their uh, questions as well.